to Joel Thomas. He scores. The Vandals win. They caught him by surprise. Chris Stormy's 98 Vandals made the Big West learn the hard way. When it comes to Idaho football, you got to watch these guys. Watch the Idaho Vandals under the open skies of Pullman's Martin Stadium against Washington State, North Texas, Utah State, and Boise State. 99 Vandal football. The Vandals are the Big West champions. How about that? you got to watch these guys. Call 1-88-88-UI. We are the tide from the north, we're brave and we're bold, defeating our rivals never gets old, making our way to the big sky conference, watch out cause here comes the silver and gold, whoa, whoa, this is Tubbs at the club for the Vandals of Idaho. Welcome back, Tribe from the North, Brave and Bold, to the official, unofficial podcast of your Idaho Vandals and the Vandals affiliate on the Big Sky Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brian Marceau, and I'm joined today by, uh, spoiler alert, new co-host, Dallas Hammer. Dallas, how's it going? Uh, it's good, but I am going to be supremely overshadowed on my first show as, uh, as an actual co-host. So without further ado, I'm just going to step out of the way. Yeah, we're, we're joined today... Viewers already see this. Uh, listeners, you might not know. The 36th head coach of the University of Idaho football team, Jason Eck, is on live with us. Coach Eck, how's it going? It's going well. It's it's an honor to be on with you guys. And you know, I've, I've heard the old saying, as you know, you've really made it when you're on the Tubs and the uh, Clubs podcast. So I'm excited to be on here with you guys, man. It's always nice to hear something like that the first time anyone says it. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to give give you a trademark right there, uh, Coach, Coach Jack. We're going to jump right in, listeners. This is Around the Bar, brought to us by Hughes River Expedition. And Coach, you're coming to us. You're obviously live on the stream. Background looks like you're in Moscow. Have you and the family made the move from Brookings already? I'm out in Moscow right now. Um, the, the family is back in Brookings. You know, I, I think we're going to try to get the kids through the school year. I got a son who's playing high school basketball right now, and you know, didn't want to uproot them too fast. But uh, uh, excited to get to work. You know, I, I think I, I wore out my wife sometimes when I was home over the holidays for being on the phone too much with you know both talking to players and recruits and putting the staff together. So, you know, now I'm out here and uh, kind of focused on that. And uh, my wife Kimberly is doing a great job with the uh, the crew back in uh, South Dakota. And we're, we're not asking for an address. We're not asking for a neighborhood. Any idea you guys going to be moving to Moscow, Pullman, or option C? Well, we're going to live in Moscow. We're going to live in Moscow. There's no uh, there's no option about that. We're going to live in Moscow and uh, excited. We, we're former residents of Moscow. You know, spent a, uh, a fun uh, three years there and excited to be back. That is, that is great to hear. And we actually, I don't know if this matters to you at all. We probably had about five or six listeners message and saying like, Hey, is, he, is this a Moscow or Pullman guy? But we, we have our answer. It's I'm, Moscow. I'm, all the I'm, way. I'm a Moscow guy, man. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I know uh, I used to work with the head coach over in, uh, in Pullman. So you know, I can't wait to have our first game against him and uh, get after his butt, but I'm a Moscow guy all the way. He, he was trying to woo me. He was trying to tell me about the, uh, the tax breaks over there, but I said, no, I'm an Idaho guy. I'm in Moscow. Well, and you're working in Idaho anyway. You work in Idaho, you pay Idaho taxes. So want to jump in a lot. A lot of our listeners and also just us personally, we followed the coaching search pretty closely or as closely as we could. And I wanted to know, this is just about you getting the job in Moscow. What was the process really of you going from, you know, one day you're South Dakota State offensive coordinator. Next day, you are still South Dakota State offensive coordinator, but you're also a candidate for Idaho's head coach. And then obviously you're eventually named our head coach. What was that process? I mean, what did it look like for, for you as a candidate? Yeah, you know, it, it's a little tricky to balance it because, you know, all, all these coaching jobs turn over during the playoffs and things. And, uh, you know, when, when the job came open, uh, yeah, I thought about it. I said, hey, that's a pretty good place. We like being there and things. And, uh, you know, I think moving to FCS, you know, my background being in FCS football the last seven years, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with it and had some experience in the big sky. Uh, so it was something I, I talked to my wife about, and uh, you know I had known you know Terry uh, Gallick uh, going back from when I was at Wisconsin. You know not not real well. We weren't real tight, but uh, you know someone I had had worked with in the past and in some capacity going back to when I was a student at Wisconsin. Um, so you know I thought it could have been a could be a fit, and 
you know, ended up, it, it took me a while to, to get an email out. And then, uh, you know, Terry got back to me and said, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you emailed me. We were, we were uh, trying to get your contact info. So I, it seemed like there was a mutual interest. I thought that was a good sign. And uh, here we are, you know, a little while later. And that's really the last like research question about before you got here, because of course the big news is you're here. So far, it's been reported that Luke Schleisner, uh, the current, I guess, South Dakota State passing coordinator, wide receivers coach, he's been reported as your next as your offensive coordinator. And I'm going to butcher this name probably. Rob Arich, South Dakota special teams coordinator, inside linebackers coach. That today uh, was reported that he's going to be defensive coordinator. So first. Can you comment on the on those two guys right now? Or uh, I, I, can, I, on staff? I can I can comment on Luke. I'll, I'll tell you about Luke. You know, Luke. Uh, I've worked with Luke the past six years, and uh, Luke is really really smart. You know, he's a. Uh, you know, they say try to get get around people. Don't be the smartest person in the room. Get people smarter than you. And, and Luke's a smart, a really really smart, brilliant guy. You know, he uh, he's a guy I lean on. Uh, you know, I think he's a guy who's got a lot of vision and foresight and things and. You know, I thought he, he was kind of my number two guy, you know, when I was the offensive coordinator at, at South Dakota State. And, and there was a lot of uh, just just visions. You know, I think he had the vision of, hey, we got to do a better job of moving the pocket and doing some more, uh, uh, you know, getting the quarterback in the move naked, play action game rather than pocket stuff. And, and, and that was a huge part you know, of our success, you know, when we had our freshman quarterback in, in the sp last spring, when we went to the national championship game. And uh, he's also just a great developer of talent. You know, he, he's a guy, he's you know, toiled mostly through the FCS and, and division two ranks. And, uh, you know, when he was at North Dakota, he recruits uh, Kenny Galladay and coaches Kenny Galladay when ends up being a great pro. When, when, and, and Galladay was so tied into Luke. When Luke left, he transferred. He transferred to Northern Illinois. And then uh, you know, even before that, he was at Minnesota Mankato when they recruited Adam Thielen and gave him a $500 scholarship and coached him. And he ends up being a heck of a pro. And then he was coaching. When I first got to South Dakota State, he was the tight ends coach. And, uh, you know, Dallas Goddard was a walk on who becomes a second round draft pick. So you're not going to find many coaches, you know, at, at the FCS level who developed, you know, three guys who were big time NFL players, not just guys who were in a practice squad or had a cup of coffee. Uh, they, they've been very good pros, guys who were getting their second contract and getting big contracts. Uh, and Luke developed all those guys. So just, you know, he's, he's an excellent recruiter, excellent evaluator. Uh, you know, I, I want to make sure as the head coach, you know, I think an error I've seen from, I've, I've, I've had kind of, uh, a well winding career. You know, I've worked for uh, you know twelve head coaches in my assistant coaching career. You know, two at two at Idaho in three years. So, I think you you pick and learn stuff from each guy. And uh, you know, one thing I think I've seen sometimes is is uh, a head coach being too involved on one side of the ball and not being able to step back. And I think uh, I think when you do that, I think the kids on the other side of the ball feel that. You know, they feel like this this guy might not be. Uh, you know, he's he's the offensive guy's head coach. He's not the defensive guy's head coach. And uh, to, to, to step away out of the confidence of someone who kind of saw my vision and shared my vision for offense. So, I mean, that was my, my key first hire. And, and again, I, I had even talked with Luke, you know, going back, you know, off seasons before the day, if I have an opportunity to go, I want to bring you with, you know, and uh, uh, just a guy who I have a great working relationship for and uh, just so excited. He, he just got out here today. He had, uh, uh, how, how about, I'll give you a little story here. How about this is like planes, trains and automobiles. So he, you know, he, he had a little beater car. You know, we were uh, we were out we're out there at South Dakota State, and you know, me, me and him have these like, uh, you know, early two thousands little beater cars we drive around, and uh, you know, life life of an FCS assistant. And so he you know he didn't want to drive it out, so he sold it, and then he bought a new car. I was able to give him a little raise. Uh, you know, out in Seattle is where he found it, so he's going to go pick it up. And you know, again, we're we're you know, I'm reacquainting with the West Coast. He's not being out here, so uh, you know, I think he under you know he's used to driving through blizzards and you know, the Dakotas in Minnesota. So, you know, they never closed the highways back there. You know, in Minnesota, they never closed it because of that. So, he, you know, he had a little problem. The pass was closed, couldn't get back. He had to go to Portland and then Portland uh, 84 was closed. So he had a long route to get here, but we got him here safely, got him all the paperwork done today and, and fired up to have Luke on board. So as you can tell, I'm passionate about Luke. It was big for me to get him here. You know, it meant a lot. You know, he had the offer to be the, take my old job and be the offensive coordinator at, uh, uh, at South Dakota State, which I, I think would have been a, a comfortable decision to make, you know, obviously they're, they're in a, in a great spot right now and have a lot of, uh, you know, just you know, establish themselves where we're trying to, to, to reestablish ourselves. And, uh, but it, that was a big, a big hire for me. And probably my first win was getting Luke to come join me. So sorry for talking so long about that answer, but I'm, I'm excited about Luke. 
No, coach, it's cool. We uh, this might surprise you. We actually brought you on for your answers. Okay. So uh, we're okay with that. Uh, last question before I pass it off to Dallas. I know that there's with how you, with how you you didn't confirm the de- the defensive coordinator report. I know that means there's some guys you probably just can't confirm on a show right now. Are there any other coaches you can tell us? We'll yeah, be coming with you. I, I, will, I will confirm with you a guy who's getting in town today. He's passed his background check. I don't want to get in trouble with it with HR. I know uh, Tim Mooney who does a great job. You know, I think he gets he gets uh, nervous. You know, that, that uh, of us getting too ahead of ourselves. But uh, Tyler's passed his background check. Hasn't started working for us yet. But we'll get all the paperwork done tomorrow. And he was the offensive coordinator at uh, the University of San Diego. And uh, Tyler was a guy who he came really, I've known him for a few years ago. I got connected through a friend of ours, uh, Jim Jackson, who Jim used to recruit in Chicago and he coached at Southern Illinois. And I've known Jim for a long time. And then uh, Jim is now at Rice. He was at UMass as the O-line coach. Now he's at Rice down in Texas. So he got me in touch with Tyler. And then Tyler was a guy like in the pandemic time when you were working at home and you couldn't go into the office, you know, I started Zooming with and just talking football and going over cutups and, uh, I, you know, he, he's a guy who loves football. Uh, you know, I, he's really impressed me because he's a guy who's, I think, an overachiever. He, you know, he played D3 football, started at San Diego as like a volunteer, and then became a position coach, then became uh, the special teams coordinator, uh, then became the uh, the offensive coordinator, been the offensive coordinator. And again, a lot of great coaches have come through, uh, you know, San Diego. You know, you know, Harbaugh was there and things. So, uh, Getting Tyler was big, and again, I appreciate him and his family. You know, he's a guy who's lived in uh, California his whole life, and uh, so I'm making a little adjustment to come out here in the, in the cold and snow up in Moscow. But excited to get him and his family aboard, and he's going to be our recruiting coordinator as well. I think he's got a really, uh, you know, at San Diego, you know, you're FCS, but you don't have scholarships in that Pioneer League. So I know if you can recruit guys, good players, to come and pay fifty thousand dollars, you, you can surely recruit them if you can give them a scholarship. So I'm, I'm excited to have Tyler. And when you say Tyler. You mean Tyler Sutton, correct? Tyler Sutton, yes. So, Coach, obviously you're looking for for the the best and brightest coaches, but what characteristics are you looking for guys in in the coaching staff? What what is the kind of guy you're looking for to be on your on your staff? Uh, you know, again, I, I like I like smart guys. I like guys who are smart. I like guys who can connect with players and and uh, build relationships with them. I think you know when you when you get close to players and, and they they. Uh, you know, they trust you. They know that you love and care about them besides just as transaction. What can you do for me? I think you can push them harder, you know, because they know that you care about their well-being. Uh, you know, want guys who are low ego. You know, I think that your staff has to fit together and you have to have chemistry. And, you know, again, there's, uh, you know, I, I've been around some coaches who, you know, every spring practice is, is trying to win, but you don't, you don't get any contract extensions for winning spring practice. You know, you don't get any bonuses for winning spring practice. I mean, it's about what you need to do and, and fall camp and spring ball to make the team better and, and offense and defense working together uh, to improve and get better, but, you know, having productive practices for everybody. So, you know, I think your, your staff chemistry is very important. And again, that that's something I've seen on some of the staffs I've been at just with me being for so many head coaches, I've been on some staffs where you really had a big divide between offense and defense. And uh, that's not good. You know, you want to have a great working relationship across the sides of the ball and everyone, you know, kind of pointing their arrows in the same direction. Uh, so uh, smart, you know, low ego uh, guys who are, are, are player driven because, again, that this is a, kind of the ultimate people business. And you got to be able to both, you know, get along and, and build good relationships with the other coaches on the staff and the players. And I also want to, I wanted guys who were excited to be here in, in Moscow, Idaho, too. I think that's, you know, I, I kind of like the, the profile of guys who, uh, you know, this is an important, you know, they're excited about this opportunity and are, are fired up to be here rather than somebody you got to beg to come here. Love it. Coach, that's something I, I, I want to quickly take a sidestep. You have brought back a level of excitement to this program we haven't seen in quite some time. So thank you for that. Uh, your energy that you've already shown is is incredible. Um, something you spoke about a lot in your press conference was that you consider Idaho a sleeping giant or that the football team is a sleeping giant. Can you kind of elaborate for us what what you mean by that? Yeah, and, and I really, uh, you know, I, I – you know, one of my – I did a, a radio show with a buddy who's got a show in Madison, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Mark Tauscher. He was a college teammate of mine. And, you know, those guys knew that. I, I kind of stole that a little bit from Coach Alvarez because, yeah, I think he said that in his press conference when he took over the Wisconsin job. And I, I think it's just, that you know, a program that, uh, you know, has a, a capability gap, you know, a, a gap from where they are right now, but really what they're capable of because of their, their – what's there. And again, for me, it's just a simple, I'm, I'm, I'm the first guy hired here to be an FCS football coach in a long time. 
And even though you'd look at the, you know, the FBS years and you had the, the 2009 team and the 1998 team and the 2016 team, you know, they were never able to kind of string that together. Well, when you go back and look at the FCS era, you know, I think, you know, 1978 through 1995, you know, you see 11 FCS playoff appearances in 18 years. And that's back when there was, you know, eight teams in the, uh, you know, FCS playoffs, you know, you know, 16 teams, not like 24 now. So, I mean, that that's really an impressive run. So again, I, I'm, uh, you know, it's not something I'm going to try to do here. That's never been replicated. And, you know, it's going to be like, you know, virgin territory that never ever has Idaho been a power in FCS football. Idaho has been a power in FCS football. And again, I think I, I'm excited about the fit. You know, I, I really, I, I love FCS football. You know, I know, uh, I know that was a controversial move. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm here as an FCS coach. I got hired from my background in FCS. And uh, I think it's a, a great level of football because it's a great balance of, uh, uh, you know, I think your, your kids are still student athletes. You know, they're not, you know, I think you watch the guys play in the national championship game the other night, uh, you know, it's a sad reality, but, you know, those guys are probably 90% football and 10% academics. I think you can truly have a balance uh, at this level. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just think it's a great opportunity to, uh, to get this back to where it's been in the past. Uh, I love the regional rivalries. You know, I think rivalries are a neat thing about uh, college football, you know, playing, you know, Montana for the, for the little Brown Stein and, you know, playing Idaho state, uh, playing uh, Eastern Washington. I mean, I think those are neat opportunities. And, you know, I, I think when I was my first year here in 2004, you know, we're going to play, you know, Troy and middle Tennessee state. And, uh, you know, I think it's neat. We can go recruit a kid from Spokane or Coeur d'Alene or Boise or, Seattle and say, you know, not only can your folks drive over to every home game, but they can drive to the Eastern Washington game and the Montana schools game and the Portland state game. I, you know, I think that kind of builds uh, the kids you want, you know, in the program. You kind of mentioned it there in the middle of that answer. The consistent success is what Idaho has been missing. Uh, I don't want this to devolve into like an FCS versus FBS talk. Is it that simple that it was just Idaho couldn't do it in the FBS or, or what was your kind of well, looking outside, looking in, what was that? issue why is, why isn't it working i think the conference stability was the biggest problem you know again if the big west was still here today they'd probably still be in the big west or you know if the WAC was still here today you know, i know the WAC has now come back in a totally different incarnation as a fcs league but I, I think that part of it was just the unfortunate thing and now you know we got a stable conference i think uh I think the conference has firmly cemented itself as the number two conference in FCS football. And again, I think we got some work to do to, to, to get over the hump of the, the Valley and what they've accomplished. But, you know, again, we're right behind, we're getting five teams in the playoffs. They got six. So, and, and again, I think the, uh, the teams out here, uh, you know, I know we, we did our, our foray moving up, but uh, you know, you look at, you know, what's happening more in the, the East and the South with, you know, James Madison moving up in the, uh, old dominions and the app states and the georgia southern you know the football fcs football out there has kind of been decimated by a lot of the top georgia southerns moving up so uh, you know i think i think fcs is really tilting towards that the missouri valley and the big sky being the two power conferences and uh you know so i, I think it's just a good stable long long-term fit you know again i think if things could have fit right i think idaho probably could have been successful but uh i'm excited here to be a part of the big sky which i think is a great conference and uh you know, I think there's there's neat things when you can recruit guys to play against. Uh, you know, they're excited against playing the other teams, and they're playing against uh, guys they competed with in high school. You know, I think there's something neat about that that uh, you know you don't get when you really get out of your region for conference games, which I know you know happened with the two Sun Belt times. You know, I was I was here for the first Sun Belt era, and then I know they had the other Sun Belt era. Okay, so Rick Sparks, he's a listener in the comment thread. He he just asked a direct question. I want to jump in with uh, Jason. His question is, he wants to know if you can elaborate on the talent gap or specifically to the extent you can this early, uh, what, what needs to happen in your mind for that gap between talent and achievement to become a little smaller yeah. or not exist? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the keys in FCS football, I think is, is developing your players. Uh, you know, I, 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 I really like, and I think that's something neat in the FCS model with the partial scholarships, you know, you, you can embrace that, you know, again, when, when, uh, uh, when we were at South Dakota state in the national championship game last spring, our offensive line, the, the starting offensive line who started every game that spring season, none of those guys was on a full scholarship when they came to South Dakota state four were on partials and one was on a, uh, a walk on. And again, I think when you start looking at, um, projecting and developing guys and, and taking 
you know, looking at those guys as 18 year old kids, where, not where they are now, but where they can be or four and five years, and then having a good plan with how we're going to develop them with nutrition, with the, uh, the, with the strength program, uh, you know, how you're going to structure practices to, to push each other and get better. Uh, you can create a product that you can't get ready made, you know, and you, you, you know, you really want when we play those money games and we go to play, you know, the Indianas and Washington States, you know, that they're, they're looking at us, you know, and, and the coaches are saying to you afterwards, cause that, you know, when we played Minnesota a couple of years ago, that's what the coaches are saying to me, man, you guys got a lot of good players. You know, you got, you know, there's a lot of guys in this roster we'd like to have here. And they weren't like that when they were 18, <laughs> you know, it was a credit to the kids, how they worked and you recruited the right kind of kids who came in and, embraced it and got better. But I, I think develop player development is the key to FCS. And I, I also think one thing that's unique up here, and I think this is part of the, you know, the sleeping giant thing. You, you look at where a lot of the power of FCS football has been. Okay. You, you know, North Dakota state obviously has set the standard South Dakota state now been in the semifinals four or five years, Montana state, in the national championship. I think one thing you see with all those Northern cold weather States is uh, you're in, you're in areas where maybe kids just aren't as developed because of, Factors not not to them. It's you know you a lot of, a lot of smaller town kids where they're playing three sports. You know they're not in dedicated strength training because they're three sport athletes. They're uh, you know it's like today. I mean you know today's not a great day to go you know run around and work on your route running if you're a high school kid in North Idaho. You know uh, you know there's just some times of the, of the year where you're not going to be able to get outside as much. So uh, I think sometimes the kids are not their their ceiling is no different than a kid who maybe grows up in California or Texas or Florida, but where they are coming out as a 17 year old, 18 year old high school senior is further from that ceiling. And I, I, I really think that's not a coincidence, you know, in FCS football that you see those schools. And I love that Idaho borders all those States. It's a chain going across. So I think we can find a lot of those same kids uh, in this area and, and develop them and, and make the, uh, the transition of, of helping them really grow so that we're, you know, cause, cause to win an FCS, you got to have a lot of FBS players. You know, you gotta have a lot of, guys who, who could play and be starters at, at FBS programs. And again, you're not, there's a reason you're getting them. You're not, you're not going to get them at Idaho because we're going to, you know, beat a bunch of the FBS programs on them and recruiting. We got to get those guys better when they're here. So they become to that level, even though they necessarily weren't there. So I, it, to me, it's all about player development. And that's, that's the gap is uh, getting the guys better once they're here. Relating to recruitment, this is pretty specific. And because of the, the transition of players who may leave the program may not, we don't know. I don't know if you have a direct answer for this. How many scholarships do you have available right now for your, what will be your first recruitment class here? Uh, you know, we're in pretty good shape. I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, around in the 15 type area, you know, to, to get ready with. So we, we have a solid amount of guys, you know, and again, there's uh you got to build in a little overage. You know, I think that's, and I, I, I think the, the transfer portal for players is a, uh, is a great thing, you know, because uh, you know, I didn't have to set out a year, you know, I don't have to set out a year coming here to coach from South Dakota state. So I don't think players should have to, to do the same thing if they came. Um, but, you know, you got to make sure, you know, to, to we want to use our 85 scholarships. Well, there, you know, it's 63 scholarships split up 85 ways. And I think that's important. You need 85 good players. You know, and that's where the partials come in. You need to get still the 85 because even though you're, your FBS or FCS rather than FBS doesn't mean you need less players. You still got to have great depth and things like that. Um, but you got to aim probably to be a little higher and then have a contingency plan. What are we going to do if we do have great retention? Because you're going to have some guys uh, that have different directions in their life and move on. And uh, I think that's healthy. You know, you know, guys, you know, I know when I was 18 year old, I was still figuring out life. So there's going to be some guys who, who decide to come to a, a college that, that end up going in different directions. And I think that's a healthy part of life. And, probably is going to be magnified the next few years even more because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the kids during COVID didn't get to come on campus, you know, to have official visits like the old days. So some, there's some kids who maybe, you know, came here, didn't know exactly what they were getting into. So. So, and based off what you've been able to do so far for like, like the evaluation of talent on the roster and the game, whatever game film from Idaho you've been able to, to cover at this point, uh, what position groups do you look like relative strengths for Idaho and what position groups do you anticipate trying to bolster a little more in this well, upcoming recruitment class? Well, I, I, and I believe, and again, this is not even a, a, you know, saying anything about our roster, but I, I think you win on the line of scrimmage. You have to be good on the offensive line and defensive line. And again, I think you, you look at uh, the teams who are, 
you know, it's one step to get to the playoffs, but then, you know, to be one of the, you know, there probably was about six, seven teams who really were true national title contenders this year. And I think there's a huge difference even between the, the rank and file playoff teams and those contenders. And those, uh, those six or seven teams are excellent there. So we, we gotta be, we can't just be solid there. We gotta be excellent there. And that, that's a process, you know, it's, uh, it's recruiting, it's developing, it's uh, getting them, getting them going. Uh, I, I will say just on the, uh, you know, on the positive note, you know, I got to spend, uh, you know, a lot of time, you know, in the playoffs watching the big sky teams, you know, I think our, our offensive skill is, uh, you know, r- running backs, receivers, tight ends, I think is very comparable to the, to the best teams in the conference uh, that way. So again, I, I think we're going to have a lot of weapons to get the ball to. And one question that we also had a lot of listeners ask, Different different questions relating to recruiting uh, potentially regional guys, which you talked about in your press conference, uh, you, you talked about here. And the question I have for you is, how is the COVID year, of, the extra year of COVID eligibility, as well as just the influence of the transfer portal, portal as well, how has that impacted your ability to recruit regional talent? Well, I, I you know, I think the, the COVID year and the extended year coming back is uh, – has made things just a little trickier because you have to project and you have a little overages and you got to work through. You're just not sure. You know, I, I had a, you know, I was excited the day, a young man, uh, uh, you know, Logan Floyd, who's been a starter and been a good player for us. You know, he, he when I, I had my initial conversation with him, you know, he brought up, you know, coach, I've, I've thought about, you know, I don't know if there's quite the major I want for a master's program. And, you know, I, I may want to, to look around because I think a place might be better, you know, fit for me for my master's I want to get. And again, I, uh, I think that's awesome. A kid wants to get a master's and, and set up his life. And he's not thinking he's not putting all his eggs and trying to play in the NFL because, you know, there's probably going to be, you know, you know, three or four guys a year who might have a chance to do that, but not everybody. Um, so I, you know, I, I supported that. I said, Hey, I, I can't argue with that. If you want to do that. Now he came today and told me, Hey coach, I, I, I found a major here that's going to fit. I want to come back. I'm excited about that. So, you know, there's, there's uh, some of that uncertainty, you know, where is it the right fit in your life? And again, you start looking, you know, there's some kids who, um, you know, six years of their life, they don't want to wait too long. I, I remember the great story about Pat Tillman. Uh, I think Pat Tillman, when he got to uh, Arizona State, told the coaches, you know, you can play me or not, but I'm only going to be here four years. I got stuff I want to accomplish in my life. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be here five years. So, uh, and some kids are going to have that mindset. They want to get out in the world and things. So it's, it's definitely a little bit of a, last year it was easier because last year if guys came back it didn't count against your limit now this year you have to be going forward you have to be right on your limit you can't have more than 63 you can't have more than 85 uh guys making up that 63 so uh you know there's gonna have to be a little wiggle room and you're gonna have to do some projecting and um you know trying to figure it out but i i don't think that has really an effect on on regional kids you know again i want to recruit regional kids uh just because a lot of the reasons i think when you when you recruit guys you have to develop uh you know, sometimes it takes them a little longer to get on the field, you know, because they're not they're not wet, ready made projects. And, uh, you know, again, a lot of our, our linemen, you know, our, our lineman who was an All-American last year, you know, he really didn't become a full time starter until his third year. You know, that was his first start was his third year. And then he was an All-American that year. Well, I, I think sometimes when, when you have that transition where guys are going to take time to develop and maybe not play a lot really early in their career, uh, it's easier to get through that if you're comfortable. You know, you're, you're at a place you, you, you would like going to school at. You're not. Uh, halfway across the country where you can get more homesick. You know, I think homesick is magnified sometimes when you're not playing, when you're red shirt and things like that. So that's one of the advantages of, of the regional thing. I think it's an advantage just you can get home quicker. You know, when you, ha- when you do have breaks, uh, you know, you, you know, we get a buy for the FCS playoffs, you get off Thanksgiving weekend. It's a good reward. You know, now the kids can, uh, you know, get home, you know, easier and still have Thanksgiving, but then be back Saturday for practice as we find out who we're going to play after the buy. Um, so th- I think there's a lot of things that I like recruiting regional. I think it's, you know, in-state tuition is makes partial scholarships more realistic. You know, again, it's, it's easier for a family to, to pay 50% of uh, in-state tuition than out-of-state tuition. So th- there's a lot of reasons why, why I feel, uh, you know, regional recruitment is, is really important, especially at this FCS level. Um, but I, I don't think the COVID year necessarily reflects it, though the COVID year does it's an additional challenge in recruiting that's going to be here really the next, you know, four or five years. I've got one last recruiting question and I promise we'll move on. Uh, Coach, how do you, how do you evaluate the guys that have little to no film? You, you kind of, you talked about like Logan, guys like Logan Floyd that have obviously played a lot. How do you evaluate the, you know, the third of the roster that really has no tape for you to watch? 
You don't. And, and, and again, I, I, you know, I, I've even told some of the people who are within the program, you know, I, I, I like, um, you know, I've asked some of the support staff and things, all right, you know, tell me who you think are top 10 percent is, who are the, who are the natural leaders, who are the guys who, uh, you know, are, are the bell cows, you know, cause I think those are important guys that we got to really feature. And then, uh, and then also, Hey, maybe who, who are some guys who you think are dragging things down? Who are some guys we gotta, we gotta talk to and address and make sure they pick it up. But I said the, the middle 80%, I really don't want to have pre uh, pre-established opinions on you. Know, I want to, I want to build the own opinion and give them an opportunity to show what, uh, what they can do. And the spring ball is going to be very important. And again, I think the, the nice thing, you know, about now the travel portal is again our, our recruiting for next fall doesn't have to be done, you know, by the signing day. You know, I, I we're going to be able to find some good players later. You know, last year uh, we were in a unique situation at uh, South Dakota State where, you know, our stack who was a, a very great, he's a great player. You know, hopefully we don't have to deal with him in the playoffs coming up. But he uh, he tore his ACL in the national championship game, and the national championship game was in May. <laughs> you know, so it's not like. You know, there's no chance. You know, it's in May and you're playing again in September. So we knew, and really our, our backup quarterback at that time had an ACL. So our really the, the two, our opening day starter in 19 and our opening day starter in the spring season both had ACL. So we, we said, hey, we got to go find somebody. And uh, Chris Oladokun came in and did a great job for us and, and led us to the semifinals. And, uh, you know, I think there's some, some opportunities there, but I, I think it's, you know, if we can add really good players now, we're going to take them, especially at positions where we're thinner on numbers. But I, I want to make sure, especially at the, the positions where we have some depth, we really you know, give guys an opportunity to show what they can do this spring and evaluate it. And then we can decide where, with those last few scholarships what we want to do uh, post-spring ball. Kind of on that same subject, uh, we have our own little dedicated group of our Patreons that pay to listen to our show. Um, thank you for those that do. Uh, that have all kind of done the same thing that I did. Went back and watched every little bit of South Dakota State football that we could over the last few years, the stuff that's streaming on ESPN, et cetera. What can we expect to see stylistically from you? It, obviously, you can't tell us a whole lot, but you, you've, you've spoken about adapting the system to the players and not forcing the players to the system. What can we kind of expect for you to, to take on this first year of Idaho football? Well, you know, it starts with, I believe, an offense of running the ball because I think when you, when you run the ball, you – you help everybody. You make the defense better in fall camp and spring ball. You, uh, you, you build toughness at the line of scrimmage. You control the clock more to keep your defense off the field. So they're not playing as many snaps. So however you're going to run the ball, whatever sets that are, I think it really comes down to, you know, in spring ball, we got to evaluate who are our best players and you know, you got to have five O linemen. You got to have a quarterback, you know, so that's, uh, those are the given. So we got, we got to find five good ones there and you got to have a good quarterback. There's no forgiveness, but then, you know, when it comes to receivers, tight ends, and, and uh, running backs, I mean, you have a lot of flexibility to what you can do, you know, personnel group-wise and formation-wise. So it's, you know, I, one thing I like to have our assistant coaches do is, you know, rank our, our players of those positions one one through ten, who are our best ten skill players. And then we got to make sure as we find out who the top five are and then the sixth, seventh, eighth guy, you know, what uh, you know what personnel groups can we be in and what formations can we be in. All right, well, then now how are we going to run the ball out of those formations? How are we going to play action pass? How are we going to, you know, have some run run pass options out of those formations? You know, how are we going to get mismatches? How are we going to, you know, trade shift in motion to try to get the defense uncomfortable, you know, out of those things? So um, there'll, there'll definitely be some elements. You know, again, I, I think, uh, you know, having athleticism at quarterback, guys who can extend plays, I think is critical in this football because, you know, when you play the very best teams, when you're, You'll see it against Alabama and, and uh, uh, playing Georgia coming up next Monday. Uh, and, and again, no different at the FCS level when you're playing, you know, North Dakota State or Montana State. Uh, you know, when they're really good on the line of scrimmage, you, you can't just sit back there and expect to have five guys win a one-on-one -on -one pass rush every every rep. You know, there, there's going to be some times the guys lose those one-on-one -on -one battles, and the quarterback can erase that if he can extend the play and, and buy time and get out of the pocket. So I think having a quarterback, not to say you always got to run your quarterback a ton, but I think you need to have that athleticism to at least extend plays and, and keep things alive. Speaking of the athletes, uh, there have been a couple plays uh, from recent South Dakota state history that have gone viral in the Idaho world. Are we going to continue to see tackle eligible plays and are we going to get the big man slash fat guy touchdowns? Because there's a bunch of us that are excited to see that. Well, I think you got to make it fun. You know, football, you, you can't let football become drudgery. You know, you got you to have some fun and, have, you know, the guys like that. We, we call them, 
we call them element plays because they're they're elements of our offense. They're not anything there, but you know some elements can be explosive. You know, you mix some of those elements together, and things go boom. So uh, we'll have some exciting elements to the offense and, and have some fun things that the players can get uh, excited about. Now, the one thing you know, the the you know, we had a fat guy touchdown this year. The, the rules in college are a little different, so you can't uh, you know you can't declare eligible like you can in the NFL to throw him the ball you know on a forward pass. So it makes it a little trickier for the big guy touchdowns, but. Uh, those are certainly pretty exciting. So the first time any any Vandals are going to be able to see one of your teams take the field is, of course, the spring game. But presuming, of course, COVID and everything lets the spring game take place. For the last decade, the spring game in Idaho has been the number one offense versus number two defense, number two, number one defense versus number two offense. At this point, is that format going to change or will we for the first time ever in the spring, well, not first time ever, but first time in a long time, see a little bit of number one offense on number one defense action? Uh, you know, I think that's important to do in the spring, but you know, I think you have to, you know, your, your spring games in college, I think you have to be very, uh, you got to make sure you're getting out of them what you need. You know, so you, you, we got to look at our depth issues. And again, spring games can be affected by your numbers at a certain position. You know, spring games can be affected by, you know, this year I think we're going to be affected. You know, the, the dome is going to be unavailable, you know, for the spring game because they're resurfacing the track and things. So, you know, we're going to have to be creative uh, with that. Uh, yeah, the dome, we're going to be outside of the practice fields for all of our spring practices this year. So, uh you know, so we'll, we'll have to see that and engage that and see where we're at. And sometimes that stuff is, isn't uh, – even determined till later in there. But, uh, you know, I think we're going to have to have some creativity, you know, with how we're going to structure our spring game. But I, I think spring games are are fun things. I think they're fun for fans to get the sneak peek. I think they're uh, fun for uh, the kids kind of, uh, you know, celebrate the the end of one stage and moving on to the next. So, um, you know, we haven't worked out those details yet, but, you know, we'll do whatever we think is best to help the football team get ready to play. And for next season, one of the items that a ton of people have anxiety about in Idaho is that over the last couple of years, spring season and then this fall season, Idaho has been pretty notorious for quarterback injuries. How do you approach? And, and when I say notorious, I mean to the extent of like playing three or four. We played, I think it was four different quarterbacks in the, yeah, we played four different quarterbacks in the spring, the six game spring season for us. And we played three different quarterbacks last fall what's your approach to keeping quarterbacks upright and healthy? Well, we, we, we adjusted that a lot this year at South Dakota state, you know, we, uh, you know, in 2019, uh, I, I felt the pain of Idaho. We, we played, you know, three different quarterbacks. We were I think five and one playing North Dakota state and had college game day there and lost our starting quarterback, uh, Jabori Gibbs to an ACL. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we ended up having three different starters that year, uh, finishing the year with a true freshman. And then the next year, uh, Mark Gronowski did a great job, came in and won the starting job as a true freshman in the spring. And uh, we, we did run him a lot. And again, that was, you know, helped as a young quarterback. You know, he, he wasn't having to read coverages quite as much and things like that. And, uh, you know, we lived by the sword and got to the national championship game. And then he tore his ACL in the national championship game early in the game. And, you know, it didn't, uh, the game didn't end well. So uh, this year, you know, we went into with, with Chris Oladokun, we wanted to, uh, you know, really try to keep him healthy. And we, you know, we had, we limited our quarterback run game. Uh, you know, we tried to do some things to make sure we were getting the ball out of his hand quick and protection and things. So it's, I think it's something you can have a, a factor on in coaching, but uh, you know, it, it can be tricky because if your best chance to win is using the quarterback in the run game, you know, sometimes you got to balance that. Uh, and I think uh, in any part of football, I think one of your jobs as a coaching staff is you got to build depth because there, there's going to be some injuries in football and you can't, uh, you can't prevent all of them and you can do some things to limit them, but uh, that that's part of who, who holds up the trophy at the end is who can manage that the best. Question for you about rivals and Idaho, which that's of course been an evolving thing for Idaho, particularly since, you know, our essentially divorced from Boise state, even back when we were FBS at this point, who would you call Idaho's biggest FCS rival? You know, I, I'm excited to play Montana. You know, I think that's that goes back to the the old days. I'm very excited to play Montana. I have a traveling trophy. You know, I think uh, uh, you know Idaho State. Uh, I think they're trying to up their program and making a more serious commitment. So I think that can continue to be a good rivalry. I think Eastern with the proximity. You know, I think we have a few good rivals. And again, I I think rivalries could evolve. You know, I you know 
South Dakota State and North Dakota State were not very good rivals until recently. You know, really until they moved to they both both moved up from Division Two. You know, in Division Two, you know, North Dakota State, and North Dakota were the rivals, and South Dakota State and South Dakota. But now, I think you'd ask anybody in those programs, they'd say it's it's North Dakota State and South Dakota State. So, I think that's kind of the natural evolution that can happen sometimes. And you know, I think those are exciting games. And got to give you your first dead horse to, to beat on in the big sky because you're people are going to ask as people talk about this, especially at media days every year. First dead horse, Coach Jack, is the big sky too big? Well, I think we're losing the team, right? I think uh, Southern, yeah, yeah, Southern, Southern Utah, Utah is going to the, uh, the whack, I believe. So I think, I think 12 becomes a, a more uh, manageable number. You know, I, I did think – you know, the thing that, that is a little unique is, you know, you have some of the uneven scheduling. You know, again, I, I think, uh, you know, UC Davis, I think, was a beneficiary of missing some of the really good teams this year and helping them get to the playoffs. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's too big. You know, I think, it, you know, the schools are, are aligned pretty well. I, I think, you know, the scheduling thing is a little tricky because I think you can end up with a year where you got a little better schedule and uh, a year where you have a tougher schedule, but that's uh, that's life. I think we're kind of winding down our serious questions. So I, I want to kind of loop this back to, to this season and, and moving forward first, uh, obviously I, it'd be incredible to go in and win every game and get a national championship in your first year. But what is success to you in this first pro this first year of the program? What, what are you, what are you looking to achieve? Well, I, I think there's, you know, first there's some things that are, uh, you are not, you know, as, as tangible, but, you know, getting, getting buy-in from the players, getting uh, alignment where everybody's pointing the, the arrows in the same direction and we're not doing things that are working against each other, you know, building really strong relationships from, you know, coach to player, player to coach, coach to coach, player to player. Uh, you know, I think those are things that are important the first year because I think those are going to be foundations and, uh, uh, you know, cornerstones that are going to help build, you know, future success. But, uh, you know, our, our goals are going to be to, to be a playoff team. You know, our goals are going to be to, to have, a, have a winning record, which I know it's been, uh, I think 2016 was that the last winning record with that champ, the team that went to the bowl game. So, you know, I just think those are some things that are uh, attainable and, and we're going to shoot for the goal, you know, you know, right away. I'm not, I'm not ready to say that we're going to be a, uh, you know, put the goal as being a national champion, you know, for now, you know, that, that's going to be down the road. I think we got to build to that, but I, I think those are, are goals that are uh, lofty, but not unrealistic to shoot for in year one. What, what can we do as, as fans and uh, supporters of the program? Uh, there's obviously a, a fairly significant portion of the Idaho fan base. That's going to listen to this episode. What can we do between today, January 4th, and September 3rd to help strengthen your Idaho football program? Well, you know, we need everybody. I mean, we're all in this together. You know, it's, again, it's, it's, uh, you know, you, know, you guys are us, you know, it's, it's, it's us, it's we, it's, it's the, it's the players, it's the coaches, it's the administration, it's the fans, it's the boosters, it's the alumni. I mean, we're all in this together and, and you guys are a part of it. And, uh, you know, I think it's a, uh, you know, you, we need to have alignment that way with everyone going direct in, in the same direction. So we need, we need people to, to get involved with the buying season tickets, you know, coming and getting their butts to the Kibbe dome, you know, every Saturday next fall, we need you to get involved with the Vandal scholarship fund. Uh, you know, again, I, I've, you know, there was a lot of things that came through from this process that I said, I thought, I think things we need to develop players, you know, we need to have training table three days a week, you know, during the season, we need to have it, you know, during spring practice and those things cost money, you know, to, to do that. So we need people to get involved with the quarterback club and, uh, and be a part of it. And again, I think that's the the kind of the neat thing in, in college athletics is uh, you can be a part of it. You know, you can be, you can say, I'm making a difference. I'm making a difference by my involvement, by, by coming to events, investing in the program, investing in the student athletes, uh, you know, cause those things make a difference. You know, when we have, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's, uh, you know, I, I was very fortunate that I came to South Dakota state at a, a very lucky time. You know, they, they had a, uh, you know, they were lousy when they were division two had, had very poor history and all the years they were division two, they went to the, the playoffs one time in division two. And now, you know, I, I came in in 2016 when they built a new stadium and had a beautiful indoor facility. And, uh, you know, I, that, those things helped, you know, those things made a big, a big difference uh, in the success. So, so we need everybody. And again, I think it's, you know, it, it's nice if you can get, uh, 
you know, one guy to give a million dollars, but it's also nice if you can get, you know, a, a thousand people to give a hundred dollars, you know, it's, we need people uh, who are involved even on a grassroots effort, you know, doing what they can to be involved. So uh, we need you, we need you. And, and again, you can very much get involved. And again, we're going to, you know, I want to make, that's why I want to come on here. I want to connect with people. And again, I, I don't, I want to, you know, obviously I'm, I'm going to probably give you more attention when you give a lot of money, but uh, you know, I want to make sure the people who give a little money still feel a connection to the program and they're a part of this and it's appreciated because uh, you know, we need that. It's, it's probably going to have a lot of similar overlap in the answer here, but how do, how do we go about getting the students and not just the students, but overall attendance back up in the dome? How do we get people, to start showing back up to Moscow, how do we get people to leave the tailgate and get butts in seats? What what can we do? What can you do? What can we do for improving the attendance and getting that that money flowing in? Well, you know, we, we got to control. We can control first of all because I, I do think the uh, uh, you know attendance is an issue like across the country right now. You know, you know my alma mater, Wisconsin. You know, they they had a lot of games where they were in the seventy thousands this year, and you know they had traditionally been a team that was eighty five. You know. Uh, and again, I think there's, there's more competition, you know, for things now there's more, you know, niche, you know, things you can do. So, you know, we gotta do, we gotta control, we can control, we gotta have a great product on the field. You know, we gotta play an exciting brand of football that people are fired up for. We gotta, uh, you know, I think connect where hopefully there's a, uh, you know, a more personal connection and people, you know, want to be around our players, you know, they want to be in, in there. So they're, they're, they're feeling the players or seeing them on the sidelines. Some of the things that maybe you can't get watching the game on, you know, ESPN plus at home. Uh, you know, make it a thing too, where the, you know, continuing to do things with marketing where it's a social event. I think you have to do a good job of reaching out and, uh, uh, you know, you got to have that. I think tailgating is great because that can a lot of times can get people who wouldn't come otherwise to, to go to the tailgating, but then we got to make sure we're, we're getting them uh, to come inside because they don't want to miss what's going on inside. Uh, but uh, I think that's going to be a continued problem. And, and again, I think that's why, uh, grassroots, why fundraising is going to continue to be a problem uh, important because again, I don't, I don't think at any level of college football ticket sales are going to be the answer going forward because there's a lot of competition uh, going there. Last couple before we transition to, I have no problem calling them dumb questions that are going to be coming pretty quick, but question I got, you referenced having worked under, I think you said 12 head coaches at this point in your career. So what are, who are some, whether it's a head coach you worked with, you worked under, or an, a fellow assistant coach you worked with, who are a few of the most influential coaches that, in your mind, there's a clear footprint on your style and what you do as a coach because of having worked with these guys? Yeah, you know, Coach Alvarez stands out to me because, again, I think Coach Alvarez, uh, you know, built something and, and was able to take something. And, you know, it was a process, you know, I think his first year, I think he was one in 10 at Wisconsin. And then he was, uh, you know, he took over in 1990. And then it was his fourth year where they went to the Rose Bowl. I think they had two losing seasons and they had a winning season. They went to the Rose Bowl. So, you know, I think he did a great job. Uh, I think his confidence, he exuded confidence, which I think carried over to the players. And, and again, I think belief is a powerful thing. You know, when you, when, when you, you believe in yourself and you believe in the people around you, uh, when you're, uh, when you feel that, when you feel that others believe in you, you know, again, I think that's a, you know, if you really think your coach believes in you, I think that's something that's reassuring as a player. It makes you play loose and not feel pressure, you know, cause you, you know, you're believed in. So, uh, th th that would be something I think that, that Barry did a great job. I think Barry was always, you know, taught us what to be ready for, what to expect. He didn't, uh, uh, he was honest with people. You know, he wasn't a, a BS guy. You know, he told you what to expect, what we were going to go into in a game, what we had to do to win. And uh, I think he built a lot of trust through his honesty with players. Uh, you know, Coach Stiglmeyer, you know, I, I think he he did a great job, you know, he, of, of uh, teaching me, you know, when you really, when you love your players, you know, you know, investing in that much, telling players you love them, that that's powerful as well. And, and again, he, uh, he stays the course that he's very consistent from day to day. And, and again, I'm obviously a lot different than him. You know, any person is different than that, but I, I think that consistency is important. You know, again, I think when you, you know, you don't want to be a peaks and valleys guy uh, as a head coach, you want to be stable, you know, for, for the kids and something that they know what, the, what they can expect, uh, you know, every day. So, uh, you know, the, the, it's kind of ironic, but, you know, I think that's like a, a tenet of uh, psychology. You remember things that are first, you remember what's last. But I would say those are probably the two biggest mentors. The, the guy I worked for last and then the first guy that I coached under and played under uh, would probably have the biggest impact. But th there's a lot of people. I, you, know, I, you know, Nick Holt, um, 
you know, I think it provided me a blueprint of, of what, of how to get going at Idaho. And again, I, I know he didn't really stay to see it through, but, you know, I think, you know, you looked at, at uh, I think some of the blueprint of his staff and, you know, I, I talked to those guys now, you know, I talked to Jonathan Smith, who's, you know, at Oregon state now and Nate Katzer who's with the, the Washington football team and Joel Thomas uh, at the uh, at New Orleans saints. So I think he had a lot of vision in his hiring where he was able, you know, Johnny Nansen's now the D coordinator at Arizona. James Craig was at LSU when they won the national title, you know, he had the vision, I think in the foresight, just like we want to talk about players, you know, I think you want to try to develop some coaches here and get some guys who are on the way up and guys who are going to end up being superstars in this profession, but maybe they're, they're not quite superstars yet. You gotta, you know, you gotta help bring them along. And I, and I think Nick did a great job of that. I learned a lot of football. I learned a lot of defense from Nick uh, that's helped me throughout his career. And, you know, his wife, uh, I think was a great mentor to my wife. You know, know, my wife, I think is going to be an amazing head coach's wife. And I had Julie Colt was probably as great of a head coach's wife as we always worked under. She brought a lot of energy and, and kept, uh, kept the wives connected and things. So, uh, you know, I'm going to take something from, from all the guys, you know, that I worked with, but, uh, you know, those are a few that probably stand out to me. The next question, this is something that has been kind of a cult issue on our show. And like I told you a second ago, we we're, we've transitioned now to dumb questions. Has anyone given you background on the King Spud Trophy yet? I don't know about the King Spud Trophy. Okay. Dallas is going to fire a picture to throw into our screen. King Spud, which the left is is la- one of the last known pictures of the original. That picture is from 1963. The one on the right is a replica that the University of Idaho Library put together after King Spud became a little bit of an internet thing, a meme, whatever you want to call it. In our, our Tubbs and Club world, King Spud's a big deal. So King Spud, it used to be a trophy given out. Uh, to the winner of the Idaho, Idaho State men's basketball game. We, of course, fell in love with the trophy because it is the ugliest thing in the world. Uh, In an article written by an Idaho State reporter, I said, I think it looks like if a potato was a sexual predator, that's what King's butt is. It's creepy. It it definitely is creepy looking. Okay. You were the first coach to – I'm going to skip that. But uh, the question we have for you, we, of course, love the ICCU money. We love the ICCU Battle of the Domes and all that ICCU has done for Idaho. But the question we have to get you on the record on, if there was a world where the King Spud Trophy, which is lost to history, that's why there's a replica, because the original thing, no one knows where it is. If we could live in a world where the trophy for the Idaho, Idaho State football game, because that's where the energy is today, is football over basketball, could be King Spud, can we count you as a supporter? Well, I, I think I think life evolves. You know, now I, we got the trophy out there. I, I walked by it this morning when I came in. Now we got the Battle of the Domes trophy, and uh, you know, th- it kind of reminds me of uh, you know Wisconsin and Minnesota play for Paul Bunyan's axe, and originally they played for a thing called the slab of bacon, and that you know what a perfect trophy. It sounds like the slab of bacon was a lot like the King Spud, and then the slab of bacon went missing. It was missing for like forty years, and they found it like in a closet somewhere, and it, it showed up all of a sudden. So. I think that's kind of the lore that, uh, you know, maybe you can never replicate that. So I, I, uh, I respect the history, but I think, you know, life's got to evolve. So I, I'm, I'm excited about the Battle of the Domes trophy, and I want to keep that uh, in the Kibbe Dome and not in that little arena they got down in uh, Pocatello. Okay. So you I, 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 I feel I offended you. This is probably no, the first. Dude, it's okay. You're right. the first. It's, it's two things. One, you're the first coach who hasn't said, hell yeah. You're also the first coach to not become visibly uncomfortable when I called the potato a sexual predator. So you're at least one for one on that. Um, the another that's probably another, why I don't want it around anymore because I, 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 you know, you don't want any sexual predators around your program. <laughs> okay, you've more than made up for saying that. No. But uh, another question we've had from listeners, and this is burning. We have seen documented evidence from your time at South Dakota State. You seem to be a visor guy over a hat guy. Dallas has some pictures of you. If you see that top row, a lot of visors. Listeners want to know why the visor. I'm a big visor guy. My wife, my wife would tell you she likes looking at my hair. She likes my hair a lot, so she doesn't like me covering it up. So, but uh, I've just kind of always been a visor guy. But I, I, I probably my wife wouldn't like it if I wore a hat. And you got to keep the sun out of your eyes. You know, you can't. I know in the dome, you probably probably don't need a hat, but uh, kind of a habit. I'm very superstitious. I like if we, if we win, I'm going to wear the exact same outfit the next week. And if we lose, I'm going to change everything. So it's, that's why you see probably a lot of different visors in that. You walk into the corner club, coach. What's the go-to order? 
you know, you know what I really kind of like that you can't get anywhere else. I like kokanee. You know, it's uh, you can't get kokanee in other parts of the country, and I really like that when I lived here. So it's kind of probably not the answer you're hoping for there either. But uh, I think that's a really good beer. It, I got to interject. Follow up question: You walk into a corner club after a win compared to after a loss. Does your drink order change? <laughs> I told you, head coach has got to be consistent for his players. Now, you know, again, I think, uh, you know, I think also the head coach has got to make sure probably after games, I got to keep a low profile. Either way, I, I probably am not going to be in the corner club after a game, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll make appearances and then I, you know, it's good for to get in there and then get out of there before the college kids get in there at, at night. But uh, what, what a legendary institution. Obviously, your show's named after it, man. So, uh, uh, what a legendary institution. I may have made one stop already since I've been hired and uh, to see it. And uh, Mark uh, over there does a great job. It was a great visit with him and his, his lovely wife. And uh, uh, you know, what a, what a great place in the history of, uh, of Idaho football. I, I love just going in and looking at all the, you know, the uh, memorabilia, you know, from over the years and seeing the pictures and things and that, you know, get heck, it would be a, uh, uh, you know, get back to the FCS playoffs and have a little picture of our team. I mean, that, that would be a, uh, that'd be almost as big of an accomplishment as being on the Thompson uh, Club uh, podcast. I'm going to assume – my next question was going to be, once you finally win the Little Brown Stein, what are you drinking out of it? I'm going to assume Kokanee is that answer. So we're just going to power right through that yeah. one. Uh, so Grumpy Joe is a big fan favorite of us, our listeners, and and I think a large part of the fan base. What are your thoughts on Grumpy Joe? And if you like him, are we going to continue seeing him? I love Grumpy Joe. I, I think it's – uh it's unique. You know, I think it's great branding for the program. You know, again, you know, I think, uh, you know, you got other eyes out there, you know, you got Iowa, you got Illinois. I think those are all the I States, but, uh, you know, there's really one grumpy Joe. So, uh, I think, I think grumpy Joe's pretty neat. I, I also like the new colors. I mean, the colors have changed a little bit. You know, I, I like the pride gold better than the Vegas gold we used to have. So I think that was a positive. So again, I, I think evolution is good. You know, you gotta, you gotta adjust in life. You got, you can't stay stagnant and always be the same. So, but I, I like Grumpy Joe. I'd love to get a uh, – I got it over my shoulder right now. I'd love to get a uh, – you know, get it on some polos and stuff too to uh, have because I think that's something kids will remember you going to the high school recruiting. Well, my last question was going to be if you preferred Pride Gold and Metallic Gold, but you are on the right side of history, Pride Gold all the way. So, Brian, do you have any last dumb questions for Coach Jason Eck? Oh, I have a thousand dumb questions, but we also promised we'd get him out under an hour, and he has definitely not been here under an hour because it took like 10 minutes to get launched. So, Coach, we have – the last thing we do for any guest is a segment we call Getting Iced, which – and there's a reason we didn't tell you about it. Getting Iced is where we ask you, Coach Jason Eck, to ask any question of me in Dallas. It doesn't matter what the topic. It can be Idaho. It can be sports. It could be anything at all. But we're going to throw it back to you before we before we, you call it a night. It's time for us to get iced. I want each of your favorite memory that you've been at in the Kibbe Dome. What, what is your most memorable uh, event in your life in the Kibbe Dome? Easiest question I've ever had, Colorado State 2009. I was, uh, I was a fourth-year senior, not yet on my victory lap as a fifth-year senior. And – that season, I went to just about every single game. I was a little bit late getting into Idaho football fandom. I grew up in a Big Sky household. Both my parents have undergrads from Montana and masters from Eastern. So I went to a ton of Big Sky games. But really, the, the Dennis Erickson team is what kind of got me back really engaged in college football again. And that 2009 season, damn, that was a lot of fun. Colorado State, that was a night game on ESPN. Dome was packed. The tailgating felt like a party because it was at night. I mean, it's always a party, but it's really a party when it's at night. So, oh, yeah, easiest question I've ever had in terms of football. Okay, awesome. I have the exact same answer, unfortunately. I was a freshman that year, so uh, it was over parents' weekend, so both of my parents came up to see me for the first time since I would left for high, for my school. One of the best nights of my life. Uh, could not agree more. It's that 2009 win over Colorado State. Okay, well, my, my goal here in the next few years is to try to create a better memory for you guys on that one, so. Well, you know, we finally get an out-of-conference FCS game with this next season, which is going to be option one to get us on track for play for a playoff berth. And I don't have our schedule memorized yet, but I know, you know, look, you draw blood against Montana 
we're all going to be ecstatic, although that should be in Missoula this year, but that doesn't matter. We're all excited for, for the season, Coach. Really glad to have you on. You've been a breath of fresh air both on the show. We love your your presence, uh, like on social media, doing interviews, all that kind of stuff. We're all happy to have you here. Uh, Jason Eck, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it, fellas. Go Vandals. Go Vandals. Go Vandals. Thank you, Coach. All right. Yeah. I just got to say it before we get into the, the ad read and the wrap-up of the show. That was the best hour I have had in years. That was amazing. Anyways. You did a season-ending review of our men's basketball team last year, and you said you really want to say that, Dallas? I'm sorry. I'm I'm just digging in on that one lost team. I'm I'm sorry, or one win no. team. Excuse me. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So we're look. Let's get to the ad read so that we can transition to to response really quick. Also, we got a ton of viewers. We have to reward our sponsor, Hughes River Expedition, for sponsoring us. When we have 69 viewers. Nice. Hughes River Expedition just brought to you around the bar, brought to you, Jason Eck. Hughes River Expedition, if you're looking for a great, all-inclusive, week-long vacation, don't look past your backyard. Venture into the largest protected wilderness in the continental U.S., located right here in the great state of Idaho. Enjoy a multi-day trip down the Middle Fork of the Salmon, the main Salmon River No Return, the Salmon River Canyons, or the Selway. You can even check out special trips like the one to see the Perced Meteor Shower. Camp on pristine beaches, run amazing whitewater, hike scenic trails, spot wildlife, soak in beautiful natural hot springs, Take in the history along the river and fish some of the most remote stretches of river in the country. You just bring your clothes, let HRE handle the rest. Hughes River Expeditions has been vandal owned and operated since 1976 and ready to take you on a vacation of a lifetime. What are you waiting for? Find out what it's like to grab a paddle, catch dinner, and ride the bull all throughout the gem state. Call them now at 800-262-1882 or check them out at HughesRiver.com. And that's the website. Okay, Dallas. Um, I'm going to throw it right back to you. I know you're, we're, we're both pretty dang ecstatic. And I got to say, Eck giving clearly a disappointing answer on King Spud was actually great. <laughs> Cause that means he's, he's just talking on some of this stuff, which I, yep. he he's caught our disappointment, but he also, Hey, he was, he was okay playing with that sexual predator joke. So that to me kind of made up for it. King Spud's going to live on no matter what anyway, but Hey, reasonable point. Dallas, Brian yes, mentioned yeah. playing with sexual predators. That is not on our hashtag only tubs. Patreon backslash tubs of the club. Playing with sexual predators is not part of only tubs, but I do encourage everyone to join only tubs. Did I really uh, say playing? Yes, you did. That is the miss uh, misspeak of a lifetime here. But anyway, Dallas, instant reaction. Um, instant reaction, I'm sold. Uh, that was more exciting than anything that's happened in Vandal football in the last four seasons. Uh, I am, I was already sold. I mean, you guys, for the, the, the listeners and viewers that have seen some of the previous stuff, Brian and I were pretty high on coach Eck when we heard he was a candidate. Uh, I know that winning the, the press conference isn't necessarily an indication of how a guy's going to do on, on the field, uh, ask you dub fans, but my goodness, Right now, Coach Eck is saying and doing absolutely everything I hoped for in a in a in you coach. And I could not be more excited about about this upcoming season. I could not be a, more excited about the hopefully three to five to ten to fifteen seasons Coach Eck is here because I, I hope he just keeps winning and he's here forever. That's I'm I'm on board committed. Coach Eck lifetime contract. Let's go. Yeah, I, I chose to not bring it up this way. Um because I would have had to interrupt you too. When he first said in his press conference that Idaho was a sleeping giant, look, our the only fan, the only tubs, hashtag only tubs at patreon.com backslash tubs the cub club to sponsor the show was borderline sexual in terms of the level of excitement people had about what it would mean to both have have a guy who's energetic, who who's gonna show some creativity, he's been successful where he is. I got to say, I didn't even know if in that second I would be able to be higher on Coach Eck, but I, I'm with you, man. Like he hung out with the, he was on the show for an hour. He gave pretty detailed answers, like, you know, to the extent he can, because uh, there's, there's some stuff he can't talk about. And w- look, once we have games, we'll have more to talk, we'll have more to dissect. But at this point, anything that Coach Eck could be doing to excite the Idaho fan base, he's doing. I mean, even coming on a show like ours where we're not traditional media, uh, we're not Johnny Ballgame on KTIK in Boise. Uh, clearly, it was worth it. He got 
got a good amount of viewers. Like we, we still have 65 people. I, I actually thought right when Eck jumped off, we'd go to like four, uh, but <laughs> Thank you guys for pretending that we were part of this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but look, he's he's winning the things he can, which I think really matters. And mm -hmm. until he gets to games, there's nothing else he can do except keep building excitement for the for the program, keep reminding people to donate to the BSF, keep reminding people that hey, games are exciting when you have season tickets. Go buy your damn season tickets. Yeah, man. I am I'm all in right now. I, I don't know how I could even be more in on on this football. I want September 3rd, realistically September 17th is when our first FCS game is. I want September 17th to be tomorrow. Same. I, 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 I it, these next seven, eight months are going to be absolute hell because I, this is where the argument for having an FCS season in the spring, I I'm on board with that argument now because I, I cannot wait for this. I have not had this level of excitement for Idaho football in such a long time. And by the fact that we have tripled our, our live numbers, uh, the comment section going off, uh, shout out to, I, I can't even read off all of the names in here. Uh, like got to get that spring game. Taylor, uh, perfect from T cash here. Uh, rack of oh, sorry, tits 69 rack. wants Simon Fraser back. Sorry, dude. By the way, rack of tits, you had some great comments I wanted to put up. I didn't know if it was going to offend Coach Eck because we don't know him very well. So I, I was like, eh, wasn't sure because I could tell he was reading things. So I, I left off. But next time I will I will go in. If he ever sh shows back up on the show, I will ask, do you have any offense seeing, I think that's Pamela Anderson's cleavage. Do you have any issue with that? I don't think most people would say so. But uh, again, I, I didn't want to didn't want to cross any boundaries we shouldn't have but anyways t cash shoot the spring game into my veins now absolutely i have never cared about spring football and this year i will i will hitchhike to moscow if i have to uh, excitement is at an all-time high excitement is at an all-time i cannot believe i didn't make a single pun in front of him yeah i I'm okay with that. You know, we, we have a second date at some point, you know, if he's ever on again to go with the, to go with those jokes. Also um, he stayed on. I mean, look, I'm just going to bring this up. He stayed on for an hour and listeners have no reason to know this. This was the easiest interview we have ever booked. I have never, and I'm counting people who are unbelievably relaxed, like Johnny Ballgame, who we love as a guest and we'll probably yep. invite some other time. Talking about guys like Coulter Nuanas who know the big sky and don't need an outline sent to him. This was so informally booked. I was half terrified at 645 when we jumped on that he actually wasn't going to, to be on the show because he he required very little of us other than, hey, what's the time? Where's the link? He'll be there. Mm -hmm. um, stay with us for an hour. That just shows, I mean, to me, again, he's he is bought in the way we need a guy to be right now to get to get fans back in. We're, we are real thankful he joined the show. Um, before we go two hours of us saying, God, we love Jason Eck, do you have because uh, we also do have a little bit of housekeeping we got to get to Dallas. Anything else? Uh, any specific points in the interview other than generic general excitement that we've already kind of beat to death? That's our new dead horse, maybe. Any any points that stuck out to you? I love his commitment to saying you know the regional talent is is something that they've got to tap into. Uh, they obviously uh, getting a guy in from California. He knows he already understands the footprint of the big sky and that we're going to have to bring California guys in, but the continuing to reiterate that Idaho is a place that football can happen and that we can bring kids from the state of Idaho here and turn them into legitimate star football players. I love that. I cannot, I cannot express enough how exciting that is exciting. That is because I remember my, one of my closest friends in high school, uh, he ended up walking on. He was a, a, a uh, no, he was on scholarship. Excuse me. He he was a red shirt uh, DB slash receiver on the humanitarian bowl team. And it was, he had no looks from really Idaho state, no looks from Boise state. I mean, Idaho state was FCS at the time we were playing in the whack. Like why, why wasn't Idaho state looking at this kid? And uh, he ended up transferring to Idaho state and joined the track team. But anyways, there are, there are good football players in Idaho. I'm not saying, we're going to field a team of 90% kids from Idaho and be world champions. But there are, there are talented kids in Idaho that should be wanting to come play for the flagship. And then 
hey, that's 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 checking the box for me. I love that answer. I just find it refreshing also to have have a coach who's all in on FCS. And I'm sure, look, if we live in a world where you know conference realignment changes things, like obviously he'll he'll probably be if he's still here, he'll still be all in on whatever that looks like. But I think it's important for this program in terms of uniting uniting the fan base. We need someone who is just completely in on FCS. We need to accept that this is where we are. And the path forward to a different conference anyway, if you want it, is to be one relevant relevant in the the FCS, which in four years we have absolutely not been close to relevant. And two, if we're relevant, we're going to have a healthier program financially. We're going to have a more exciting program in terms of butts and seats, which is just going to put us in a better situation if that realignment ever comes now, I don't really care to talk about realignment right now. Cause until it's taking place for us, it's, it's just, it's just a discussion. So for me, I like hearing someone speak in my language of I, my, my background's FCS. I was probably recruited because my background's FCS. I'm bringing in FCS guys like, Hey, in case we buried the lead for you guys, uh, Bruce Feldman reported today that our defensive coordinator is going to be Rob Arich from south dakota not south dakota state just south dakota university of south dakota he was the special teams coordinator and inside linebackers coach over south dakota this season uh we asked that he obviously he said he can't confirm it for hr purposes right now but hey don't want to bury the lead our two main our two biggest coaches appear to be in place uh it's good to hear that luke schleisner who we talked about for quite a while ago on this show is a guy who Bruce Feldman confirmed not too long ago as well. Um, it's good to hear that he's been on board with Eck for a while. Cause that means at least to the extent he can, he's already had some continuity in terms of organization for the coaching staff. Um, so I guess those are the things that stuck out to me is all in on FCS and, oh, and you, I can't believe I forgot to ask because I was trying to pivot um, about trying to get soft commits for a coaching staff when you're applying while also coaching the playoffs, but whatever. There's a, we'll probably never ask him that question now. So, hey, uh, truth bomb for you guys. But those the, those are my takeaways. I'm, I'm rambling, man, Dallas. Um, before we get to our house, let's close us out and then get to our own house cleaning. I have one follow-up on that real quick uh, because the FCS, FBS thing I don't think is ever going to go away. I will completely admit I was on, let's move back to the FBS, that was, or FB, FCS. I was on that train, but I have no, I don't have the Montana history that you do, Brian. I was four years old when Idaho moved to the FBS. I think anybody that is still devastated that Idaho is here in the FCS, I think Coach X's answer was the best that either side could hope for because what he spoke about is conference stability is what matters. That was not necessarily a screw that we're staying in the FCS. I have no interest in moving to the FBS. It was a the conference has to be right. He spoke about the Big West falling apart. The whack fell apart. Idaho joins the Sun Belt as the last trying to grasp at stability. And then obviously rules changed and they could survive with 10 members and get a conference championship game and and kick us out. At the end of the day, that exact answer sounded like a guy who, if the big sky had decided to split in two and put an FBS conference up, that sounded like a guy that would be all in on that kind of idea. So I do want to say, I think that's a really good way to kind of heal the fan base and say, look, Conference stability is what matters. And that's not necessarily not necessarily saying FCS is the place for Idaho. It's saying FCS is the place for Idaho right now. No, and no, like it's said, that could it's change. making it's making the conversation like, hey, let's just talk about where we are. Things change. If things change, they change. Whatever, guys. Let's but we need to not be bitter about 10 years ago or however many years ago. That that's why I like him acknowledging where we're at. I mean, you could say it's an mm-hmm. apolitical answer, which is fine. Because I think at this point, that's the way you bring people together is you try to not make it that big a deal and say, look, if, if there's something better, let's talk about when there's something better. The last point I want to touch on is this is actually addressed in the comments by Boomer Vandal, who is also quite famous on All Vandals. All Vandals has a mix of some of the smartest, most connected Idaho listeners and the, or Idaho fans, and then the opposite. Boomer Vandal is one of the smartest, most connected um, Vandal alums there is. And one of the things he, he just said in the comment thread, there's eight to 10 unsigned Idaho high school players that are fully capable of making a big impact on Vandal football. He starts to name a few. 
I'm going to butcher their names for fun. Ethan Makita, Cody Walk, Brett Spencer. There's only one butcher there. But I, li I liked his answer about having region regional ties to the program. I don't think – Idaho is not the same as Montana or South Dakota or North Dakota where we're not the number one drawer, drawer of eyes in the state. And Idaho can't do anything about that. But I do like the idea of, hey, let's try to get a more regional footprint – Let's try to make Idaho a destination school for local kids to the extent we can. How do we do that? We bring them in first and then we start winning and we develop, we develop those pipelines from North Idaho, from Boise, from places in central Idaho as well, where kids grow up, you know, they're in high school and they're aware of guys who were like a senior when they're a freshman who went on to Idaho and they were successful. So it becomes a little bit more of a destination. Um, Eastern Washington to the extent it can has done that. There's no reason that Idaho cannot do that as well. We could keep going for quite some time, Dallas, but we actually have a Tubbs at the club specific announcement we need to get to. And that is, you may have noticed Dallas was labeled as, labeled as a co-host today and he was labeled as a co-host because I got a GED. Yeah, that too. But, uh, your your regular co-hosts now are going to be me in Dallas. Uh, Chris Hammond, uh, the the father of the podcast, who this would not be here if not for his work. Only Tubbs would not be here if not for the organizational work he did. Um, both Chris and Alex, best of all time, Boatman, uh, they've had to, they have to step away from the show. Um, really, it's just that we've told you guys before this show, though only Tubbs is absolutely paying the bills for us. We love every only Tubbs donor patron patreon.com backslash tubs at the club. It certainly doesn't pay, like it's not paying rent for us. And um, Chris, both Chris and Alex, they, they just got to a, to a point where in their professional careers, it was becoming tough to push both professional careers and tubs at the club. So they're not going to be on the show anymore, at least as, as co-hosts. Um, they're not really affiliated with the show at this point. That was, that was a voluntary thing. That was, there's no, uh, this wasn't like a rough divorce or anything. This was just unfortunate. This is just where, where we're at. We're really thankful for the work that Chris and Alex did over the last few years in helping make the show what it is. And don't be shocked if periodically we see, we have one of those guys on as a guest, but from here on your main hosts are going to be me and Dallas and pretty soon Martin hot take Heemstra is going to be the new producer. I, for one, am, am excited, ec excuse me, excited uh, to get more of Hot Takes Heemstra on the show. Uh, Martin, I know you're listening. Uh, I highly value your opinion, and also you're one of the funniest guys I know, and I think that's going to really uh, bring a new flavor to our show. Maybe it might be a little bit more R-rated, maybe even X-rated, hashtag only tubs, who knows? But yeah, that's uh, that's kind of our housekeeping things. Um, from here on, we have the basketball episodes that will be coming on Saturdays if we ever get to play basketball games. The last two men's basketball games were canceled for coronavirus issues, I believe, within the Idaho program. Uh, no news yet on the Montana State game on Thursday and the Eastern Washington game on Saturday. But fingers crossed Eastern Washington game holds because there may be the first unofficial Tubbs the Club slash only Tubbs get together in Cheney, where if the game is being held, I know Martin plans on going to both games. Dallas, I don't know if you plan on going to both games. I'm going to go to the men's game at 745. Um, if you, if any of you guys are able to make it to Cheney for the basketball game, if it's played, send us a message. Find us, man. We'd uh, One of the things that's been fun about doing the, the Patreon and the Discord is we do get to talk with people who are into the show and Idaho football in a way that we hadn't previously. Uh, we'd love to be able to meet more people who are into the show, patron or not. We'd love to be able to meet you, talk, talk Idaho sports with you. We'll be there at the game if it's not canceled. Any other housekeeping things we need to get to, Dallas? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I guess the housekeeping is, do we even know when our next regular Tuesday show is going to be? I think we're at the point where we're, I mean, we'll, we'll obviously reconvene to talk coaching updates as we get them. Uh, but I think we're, we're close to the point where we do the transition to the Saturday basketball show being the, the main show until spring football. Yeah, so producing in public, my answer here would be as football news comes up, we'll do that on Tuesdays. 
because uh, that's where that's when the, the eyes are here for football and the eyes will always be here for football. But we're not going to do football shows for no reason, which is what we did last year. We didn't do football shows for no reason. So, yeah, um, safest thing to say is at this point, shows are shifting to basketball. And uh, if there's football news, like probably when the rest of the coaching staff gets filled out, we'll do an episode to talk about talk backgrounds of the guys who are going to be on our staff. But until then, it'll probably be intermittent on the football episodes on Tuesdays. Cool. That's all. And that's all I have to say about that. I think that's, I mean, that's, that's producing live in public, everybody. These are the yeah. conversations that Brian and I have off at, off the show of like, what the hell are we going to do on Tuesday? Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to, we're going to close it out and just want to bring up, uh, we will probably plug the VSF gala in Boise as we close in on that. That's later in January. Uh, Rick Sparks just plugged Vandal ski weekend at Lookout Pass, February 25th. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to go to to that, but hey, it, it, look, VSF groups, you got events, we'll plug them on here. But other than that, man, really happy to have Jason Eck on here. Um, really happy with direction Idaho sports are going. It's basketball, of course, is a separate issue, which we'll talk about as a separate issue. It feels nice to be just uninhibited, uninhibitedly, unironically just in to what's going on with this football team. It is great to be there. Haven't been there for a long time. And I think with that, it's time for Kobe Cuff to play us out. Go Vandals. I mean, guys, if that, if that didn't fire up for Go Vandals, what's going to? Go Vandals. So raise your glass and have a drink with me. Here's to the Vandals and the craft. I'll just out there living the dream Part of one and only Moscow drink